What's up, guys? Welcome to Social Media Entrepreneurs. Today, I am joined by Niala Thorpe. She is the founder of Market Your Message, which is not just a, a company that includes an agency, a coaching business, but it is also the name of her podcast. You got to check this out, Market Your Message. Just type that in. You'll see her uh, right away. And uh, I was just on her podcast, actually. We're going to have the interview come out today, but we're going to be getting completely different value out of Niala today. And uh, I'm really excited because she does a lot of content creation processes like the ones that we just talked about on this show. So if you just heard a recent episode where I talked about how to like turn a YouTube video into a blog and, and reels and all of this uh, other other sources of content. This is what she does professionally for a bunch of businesses. So we're going to dissect that. And we're also going to be talking about just how does storytelling your message really uh, factor into marketing. So a lot of good stuff to cover today, but how are you doing today, Niala? Hello, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. We had a great time uh, yesterday doing the, yeah. uh, your podcast. And uh, tonight it, it's pretty late. We had to fit this in last minute, but uh, I don't know about you. I have so much more energy at 7 p.m. than 7 a.m. So you know what people say, some people say, I, like I say, I'm a morning person, but I have energy at night too. I don't know what it is. I'm just, when it comes to business, I'm just always on. I'm always ready. I don't know what it is about about it morning or night. <laughs> nice, nice. That's the way you want to be. I, I think whenever you're winning, it's not hard to stay motivated. You know, if you if the sales are coming in and the business like your day's already planned for you, like how can you not be excited to take it on? Yeah, yeah. Uh so we'll talk about the this cool new offer that you're doing too, because you've got like a done for you service. You're in an office and you you've got an office building now that you cater to clients to help them do this content creation. Um, but backing up, I want to talk about market your message because I think storytelling or like story selling, as it's often called, is one of those topics where I know it's so important. And I share stories here and there to like back up my points with like personal experience. But I don't think I've really honed in on like, what's that major story that if I'm doing a, a keynote message, the story that always comes up and and how do I go about picking out what that even should be? Um, so give us an overview and um, direct my thoughts a little bit, if you could, into how yeah. someone would find their story. Yeah, definitely. So there's an exercise, right? There's an exercise that I like to start clients off with. I call it the timeline exercise. So, you know, back when we were in school, we would draw the number line. It'll start off with zero and then it goes to negative one or right positive one. So I would say draw a line in the middle of your page and start at the earliest memory you could remember, okay? Everybody earliest memory is at a different age, but your earliest memory, anything that happened in your life that's positive, you write on the top of the line. And then anything that happened in your life that's negative, you write on the bottom of the line. If you start at the, let's say 12 years old, earliest memory, then from 12 years old to present, you have all these different events. And what always happens when I do this with my clients is as they're going through their line, there are some of these events that evokes an emotion. There's an event that they see that was a definitive moment for them. It is something that happened in their journey that sent them on a path, you know? And that path led to where they are right now, right? And that's how you figure out the parts of your story that's going to be impactful. A lot of times people think that their story has to be about what they sell. It doesn't, right? The story is really about the client. The story is really about the person who, you know, you're, you're talking to and how it connects to you through emotion, and so that's, you know, the exercise that I do with people and it never fails. We always end up finding the moments of their story. Once we get those moments, then we put it together using my captivating story formula. So, you know, mm -hmm, go ahead. 
so what's the main goal of the story that we're looking for? Is it for our clients to be able to relate to us quicker and say, oh, that's a life experience I can relate to? Is it more to like build our credibility of like where we came from and where we are now? Or is it to kind of, I think you alluded to like the, the invention of your products, like if you had some nutritional shake, right? It's usually the story of the day that I realized that coffee was bogus and I wanted to make my own thing. Something like actually, that. actually, Derek, it's all. It's all. Okay. It's all. Your story is to connect emotionally. Your story is to tell the story behind your offer, your product, your service, right? Your story is to do all of those things. As a matter of fact, there are different types of stories that do different things. So for example, your brand story would probably be about your journey of yourself, if you're a personal brand or the product, if you are a product brand, right? Whereas we have another story that's called a regret story. And we use the regret story usually around the time where we're giving a call to action. And so the idea of using a regret story is to share something in our life where we may have regret. Why? Because we want the people who are listening to click into that mind where they're like, wait a minute, I don't want to regret missing out on this offer. I don't want to turn around and realize I didn't take action, right? And so it's all of it. it everything that you said is what the story does. And that's the power of stories. And when is the main time that you use a story? Is this going to be like, like for podcasts, when you come on and do an interview, it's probably good to have your back pocket stories for introducing yourself to a new audience. But does it find your way even into like short Instagram reels and such like that? Or is it more for like when someone's about to consider me as uh, or they're about to be a client, uh, this is more, you know, at the time of closing, like you said, with the regret story. I believe stories should be weaved into your brand like a vine. I think that stories should be used all the time, whether it's to introduce yourself, whether it's to explain something, whether it's a visual story, like you said, whether it's on a, a video, right? Whether it's through pictures, right? So I'll give you an example, even with photos, right? Like how to use photos to tell a story. With my brand, I work with women, right? Right. But one of the things that I'm very adamant about is like, I work with all women, not just black women, all women. So when we pick our photos and we're putting out our events, we are very aware, right? Of how, how, how we show our clients in our photos, how we tell the story of how we interact with our clients. So I just feel like stories are everywhere. There's not a pick or choose. It's all the time. You can tell one story, like let's say you're in the middle of a launch, you're launching a product. You can have the story of the idea from ideation all the way until when we launch. And you're telling all these little stories all through your launch, right? But then you can also have stories after your launch where you're sharing your, your staff. <laughs> where you're sharing how you make your product through stories. It's just, I don't even know. You see how excited I'm getting? Because it's like stories is everything and you can use it anytime. So someone out there who's got some ideas for how to market their product, how does it normally happen when, when the story gets added to the marketing message? Do they kind of come up with, all right, these are the major selling points for our product and this is how we want to pitch it. And then you reverse engineer, like what story would accomplish all of these points such that I can just tell the story instead of hard sell them. Is that often how it happens? Yes. Yes. Now, sometimes it could start off with just, let's start from the beginning. Why? You know, like for me, when I work with clients, I like to start with the why, because I feel like that's the part that matters the most. So we'll ask the question, why did we create this product? Right. And usually that's the first story you'll start with. But then strategically, what you're bringing up is called strategy, right? Where you will write down the, mo the most important points. And then you'll step back and say, what customer stories, personal stories, even sometimes it's not even stories. Sometimes it's facts that is out there, right? That you decide to use as a foundation of a story. 
Um, but you can make sure that it matches the different pain points, the different features, the di- right? So yeah, that's how we do it. How effective is it if someone thinks, you know, I really don't have the greatest story to get across the point, but I love this story of this other person. Like, is it okay to just tell a story that's not your own? I don't like telling a story that's not my own, but that doesn't mean that you can't say, you know, I was, you know, I was at an event. Like I do this sometimes. I was at an event and I heard a speaker share this story. You you understand? It's like, let's share. We can, I don't like to, because I feel like we all have stories. As a matter of fact, I have a framework framework called the leverage your life formula. So I teach people how to leverage everyday events that's happening and turn it into stories to connect with your audience. So I feel like we have so many stories. However, yes, we share other stories, right? Um, There wouldn't be movies made on other people's stories if we didn't do that. But I think we should just always operate in integrity when we are doing that. Like, don't tell a story and pass it off like it was you, you know what I mean? That's when you're crossing a line. You know what I mean? I I think uh, another little random thing I like about storytelling or story selling in your marketing is when you're on the lookout for new stories, as failures happen in your business, you kind of instantly register it as, oh, this could be a good story later (laughs) to potentially sell stuff. I kind of said, like, since I started the podcast, like failures in business are just podcast episodes. And then successes are courses and podcast episodes <laughs> you <laughs> that's know, a so, good way to look at it <laughs> but yeah when it turns into your marketing uh i look back at some of my major failures like times i've been scammed even in business and i am like they you know a couple years later it does turn into a useful story for someone else it almost uh when you say that you want to be an online coach and be able to help other businesses you almost sign yourself up for a yeah. bunch of failures so that you can actually <laughs> have the perspective to do so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's move on to the content creation process stuff. Uh, so this is something you do for other businesses. And do you do this for yourself too? Do you have a, a YouTube channel yeah. along with your yeah, podcast? Actually, we just started a YouTube. Market your message. <laughs> cool. We just started YouTube. We took Q2 off this year. Um, to make a little pivot in our social media and content strategy. And I decided to start with YouTube. So I'm enjoying it. I'm actually, I think at 275 subscribers, I just hit, which is awesome. So um, (laughs) yeah, we are on YouTube. Nice. I'm still counting every single subscriber that comes in. I celebrate (laughs) even the views. I watch like a a video that's seems like it's dead it just go like what get one more view and i'm like that's all i need to just yeah. get some traction <laughs> going eventually we'll get uh yeah. you know, views because a lot of times when you're a smaller channel it can be like a few months before a video just starts to get Pick picked up, up. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah you got to celebrate the, those little wins uh, all right so how does your content creation process uh start and what are some of the, the next steps that it goes through Yeah. So of course, everything starts with the strategy, right? So when it comes to content, we first think about, well, where are we delivering our content, right? So because I do this for clients, everybody's strategy is different. So like I have one lady, Jane, who teaches video marketing and she is 65 years old. And she loves LinkedIn and she owns a television station in Canada, right? And so she doesn't like the Instagram or anything. So her strategy starts with LinkedIn. And then we also have other clients, right, who might do TikTok. So it first starts with your strategy. Where are you? Who are you speaking to? What are your content pillars, right? How are we, you know what I mean? Where are we leading each of these platforms? And once we can answer those questions, then we go into our client strength. So this is the fun part. So when I say our client strength, every content marketing strategy starts with a long form piece of content. You cannot duplicate something that's five minutes as effectively as you can do with something that's about 30 minutes, right? Um, So everything starts with a long form piece of content. However, not everybody's great at video. 
some people might be great at writing. And so their long form piece of content might be a written piece of content. We have to start with that, right? Or like you, your main content might be podcasting. And so with you, it would start with podcasting. So the first thing is, I'm just repeating myself. I'm a teacher, so I want to make sure you guys are keeping up with me. So the first thing is, what's your long content strategy? Content. Then oh, what's yeah. your long form? Yep. Yeah. Then what's your long form content? So once you have your long form content, then you're going to look at this long form content and you're going to see how can I break this long form content down to fit my strategy. So I'm going to use my business for an example. Our long form piece of content right now is YouTube. It used to be a Facebook. It used to be a, a live in my Facebook group every week for, for years. Now it's YouTube, right? And so that's the long form piece of content. But then my content strategy includes TikTok, Instagram, Facebook group, right? Facebook fan page, business page. So these are all the places where we syndicate content. And so now that I have this long form piece of content, how are we going to break it down? Oh, plus I have my podcast. So we strip that. We have the audio, intro, outro, add a couple of commercials, boom, podcast episode. See, if your strategy includes a blog, which ours do, transcribe that video, turn it into a blog goes on the website. And you can also put it anywhere else that takes articles like LinkedIn, Medium, okay? And I'm going slowly because those of you who are listening, you should be taking notes. This is good stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then we're talking about my strategy. So now we have TikTok. We usually get about five snippets from a 20 to 30 minute video. So we get five TikToks. We get five snippets for Instagram, okay? Those are less than 60 seconds piece of bite-sized content from that long form video, right? And we also pull out some quote cards from the transcript. So those are our tweets, our, you know, quote cards that go out on Instagram. Um, let's say I, in a video, in my long form piece of content, I taught six ways to market your business. We can pull out those six ways and it gets turned into carousel. Let's say I share a story in that video. We can pull out that story. You see what I'm saying? So guys, if you see, so I can keep going because again, all of this is not created equal. It is customized to every client. And so that's why I always say you got to first know your strategy before you could take a content marketing machine like this and actually make it work for yourself. You know what I mean? So one piece of content, you could get about 15 to 20 pieces of content from one long form piece of content. And what struggles have you found with getting that content to be like a trending post on all of them? I think this is the biggest struggle. I think when, when you look at a multi-purpose strategy like this, it's mm -hmm. like, it makes so much sense. You just make one piece of content. And then it goes everywhere else. And I've seen some businesses, maybe they make like a bunch of audiograms out of their podcast. And then they don't really do that well as Instagram posts, right? Especially if they don't do it as a reel. Like yeah, you can yeah. see sometimes businesses lose that like throughout the process, they more like check boxes like, hey, we did a post over there, but they didn't really like make a post that 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 app really wanted to see. It doesn't really do that well. Yeah. Uh, have, have there been some major you know, uh, problems with this and, and how have you solved those? Well, I think that when people are doing it themselves, absolutely. But with us, we don't have that issue because we start off with the content marketing strategy. So we know what our goals are with each of your platform and each of the pieces of content. Another thing is content don't always go out at the same time. So what goes out on Instagram this week might not even go out on another platform until next month. Why? Because it doesn't fit the strategy for that month, right? Let's say our client is launching something or, you know what I mean? The next thing is content is just like, let's say we create, you have a long form piece of content and we create five TikToks. I mean, that's just five TikToks. 
What really turns it into what you call, you know, viral content or trending content would be the audio you choose to go with it, the caption you chose to go with it, you know, if the hooks, you know, that you put on, the, the all of that matters. And so that's why I would say we don't make those mistakes because we are experts at this, but we see these mistakes a lot when people are doing their own content because you're right, they are just checking off a box. They are just saying, well, I have to post on social media today. So let me just pull one of these things and put it out. But where's this leading? Everything has to be an ending goal. For us, it's always lead gen, right? Because we understand our KPIs is we want our clients to get leads. So everything we do is to get them leads. You understand what I'm saying? So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in these businesses that all the content marketing's goal is to get leads, is this usually leading to just one free opt-in? How often are these businesses that you work with? When does it look like they have a bunch of different free opt-ins and, and different ways they send people versus just like kind of one free opt-in that it all leads to uh, at least in, in certain periods of their business? Is that usually how it looks? You know, I'm going to say that it varies. Um, I, when it's people who comes from my coaching programs, then it's one. Because when they go through my coaching program, I teach them the value of the law of ones and making sure that you have one funnel that you're sending people through until you get to a certain level. Um, but a lot of people don't come like that. In those people, that's when I'm giving advice and telling them, hey, what's your focus? Because we can't, you know, be everywhere. We want to get a focus on one thing. Um, and, and so that's the advice that I would be giving them, you know. And then the next thing is launching, right? If somebody is planning on launching a workshop or a challenge or a product or something, then obviously around the, that time, the content strategy is going to ramp up and it's going to be a different type of strategy than the normal content that would go out regularly, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and how often do you have call to actions in your content that would be directly to book a phone call with you rather than it be leading them to a lead uh, or gen, like a free resource first? Um, I, I actually, for me, I work with a lot of high end companies and coaches. So for us, it's not really a freebie, right? So for us, a lot of times it's, if you're ready to work, DM the word ready, comment below, yes. And once someone comments, then maybe that client has an appointment setter that might reach out to that person and get that person an appointment. But if you're a solopreneur, because I've done all of this for myself before I got to this point, right? So if you're a solopreneur, it's, I say, follow the 80-20 rule, okay? So let's say we're talking about one week. And let's say you post, you put 10 posts out for that one week. That would mean that two of those posts should be a direct call to action to book a strategy session with you or whatever your call to action is. Whereas the other eight posts would be following my 5B method, which is educating, entertaining, position you as an expert, right? Empowering you in some type of way. So that's how you follow 80, 20 when it comes. But here's another thing. And, and this is just all coming to me as I'm speaking to you guys. Every post should have a call to action. Every post. So even if the two posts might've been a direct call to action to get an appointment with you, the other post might say, might end with a question and tell them comment below or might say, join my Facebook group. Every post should have a call to action because call to actions position you where people are now taking a direction from you. You're starting to influence them and you're starting to get them to listen to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're practicing giving that direction and getting people to listen to you. If you can get them to make those micro commitments, then hey, you'll get them to make bigger commitments, you know? Yep. Yep. 15 minutes before this podcast started, I just posted a reel where the, the message is essentially how you always need to have a call 
call to action. Oh, There's a really good audio that worked well with it. it. It's pretty funny audio, actually. So I was like, okay, this is a good way to to introduce yeah. that. So yeah, <laughs> right on the same page. I wanted to ask you about uh, going from solopreneur to having a team. What ended up being the correct first hire for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Because I really did go through a lot of trial and error with that. Um, For me, it was operations. For me, it was getting somebody that can fill in where I fell short. Um, So that was like my first really good hire. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, And then I started hiring for each gap that I had, right? So like video, I decided I was going to start putting a lot of time towards video and getting one video edited started to become very expensive versus me having a, you know, video editors on my team. Right. And so I started off with one video editor and then I just grew one, one, and I'm still growing, still growing. So in operations, was this uh, like maybe in your content creation process, if you're finding, hey, I'm putting out the YouTube videos, like I'll edit that. I hate it, but yeah, I'll I'll edit it. And I got put out the podcast, but like, I just don't have enough time even to do like the Reels TikTok side of thing. You would say like hire out the job that you don't even have time to do. Yeah, yeah, I I am a firm believer on that because I I spent so many years I spent so many years and I know I could have been so much more successful. Everyone, every time we do interviews, people would always say, if you would start all over, what would you do? And I will always say hire fast because, you know, you waste so many time trying to do things that you're not good at. And then when you do put it out, it's mediocre. It's average. It's not even converting because it's not your area of expertise. And so I believe in outsourcing. Now, obviously, it's not always, you're not always in a position where you can. And I am that person. So I didn't get to really share my story here, but I started from the bottom. When I started my business, I was a single mom on welfare. You know, I I had nothing, (laughs) you understand? And I could not hire, which is why I used to spend nights on YouTube learning everything, which is how I became so good at what I do is because I learned through doing. However, I went back into the workforce to pay for my first VA. I went back, I used to work as a bookkeeper for a company called Overhead Door, very famous company. So most people who have garage doors know that company. And um, after I left, I'm like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur doing my thing, but I needed a VA (laughs) and I couldn't afford a VA. And so I went back and I went from being their bookkeeper to filing, part-time filing to pay for my VA. And it was the best decision, even though that VA ended up firing me (laughs) because I wasn't ready for him. Um, But it was the best decision I ever made. Because that they got some work done for you and then you were able to just get another VA hired after they left? Yeah. Yeah, I was able to get clarity. My first VA, who's actually an agency owner now, Facebook ads agency owner now, Uh, But my first VA who was so kind and he was, even though he fired me, he let me know, like, listen, a VA is not going to run your business for you. You got to get your strategy. You have to know what you're doing. So uh, when you get a VA and they're giving you 10 hours, they know where, you know, they're putting their 10 hours. I wasn't ready for it. Right. And so, but that, that taught me, that taught me. And then my next VA, I was more prepared, you know? And so, yeah. What were some of those uh, initial jobs that you got off your plate? So emails, <laughs> emails for one, um, scheduling my social media. I still used to get my social media together for myself. Every Sunday I would sit and, you know, put my social media together, but then they would schedule it for me, you know, responding to people when, when they, when they post, especially because I was still working. So it's like, I didn't have the time, you know, to do all the things that I needed to do or like 
if I wanted to, because I started off doing a lot of webinars. So if I wanted to do a webinar, they would create the lead page for me. They would set up the convert kit for me. And these are things that really helped. Con convert kits, the CRM you use? Yes, I love it up until this day still. Nice. What I do you had, use? <laughs> I had ConvertKit for my e-commerce business for a while. And then when I started the digital education business, I got in someone's program and they're like, <laughs> You should use Active Campaign. I was like, I'll just like keep using ConvertKit for e-com and then I'll use Active Campaign for this. And then I was like, quickly realized like I liked ConvertKit's uh, overall layout and the look of it just a lot nicer in yeah. Active Campaign. Uh, I read somewhere like the deliverability is better on Active Campaign. So I was like, okay, I'll just stick with that. Take that. But, okay. uh, it seems to be does that it doesn't really matter, honestly. Like the deliverability <laughs> is more subject to the the sender than the the CRM. So uh, so yeah, I, I might mess around uh, and and go back to a different go back. To, yeah, yeah to them. But uh Kajabi is also it looks really cool for e-commerce uh businesses okay. at least. It looks better for making emails that have a bunch of products in them. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But okay, interesting. Not a lot of people use ConvertKit. Uh, not that I've talked on to. The like, e it seems like everyone's on. Probably, probably more so on. Be because if you go to the ConvertKit website, one because I use ConvertKit for my messaging training a lot because they have a very specific audience. So they really do cater to the digital entrepreneur, you know? So maybe that's why on ecom you know, it might not be big on that side because on the coaching side, on the service side, everybody who I know use ConvertKit. Really? Or yeah, or they go to like Entreport, you know, or Infusionsoft. You know, I know Active Campaign as well, but ConvertKit is pretty popular. Yes, and then Mailchimp is supposedly the most popular by far, yes, but like I is. don't, not a lot of people actually use them. No. Nah. Not once you get <laughs> newbies do. Yeah. Um, it's that popular because it's cheap and because it's a newbie. To me, it's a newbie platform. When I first started growing lists, I was in network marketing. So I use get response because in network marketing, they would always talk about get response. But then when I transferred into the coaching industry, I started with MailChimp because everyone said MailChimp. It's free. Start with MailChimp. But I quickly, as soon as I found out about ConvertKit, I moved. <laughs> yeah, it, it's for, for for newbies, but at the same time, I think it's like more confusing than ConvertKit. So uh, I, they're just really good at marketing. It seems like, uh, and, pretty, and then, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Best marketer wins uh, always. <laughs> yeah, more than the best product in in most scenarios. Uh, so final thoughts here. We've gotten so much out of you. Uh, I, I know you said there, there's like a guide or like a framework that you have for leveraging your story, something like that. Uh, where yes. can people get more info from you? Yes. So I would love to invite you to my community. That is the best place to connect with me. Because when you come into the community, as soon as you go under the guide section, we have everything separated from stories to message to offers. So you can literally go in <laughs> to where you need your help and get the help. So I would rather invite you to my community. Can I do that? Yeah. <laughs> so you can go to joinniala.com, join, and Niala is N as in Nancy, Y-A-L-A.com. And I'll make sure that I give Dirk that link. <laughs> Sweet. That's a text community, right? I'm um, sorry? Is that text community? No, actually, that's my Facebook community. <laughs> okay. Okay, sweet. Yes. Community is like the name of a really popular SMS platform. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, so I didn't, okay. I was like, oh, are you using that community SMS thing? But oh, okay, uh, okay, no. but yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so still using the Facebook group. I was going to ask yeah, about so that So actually, earlier. no, I use the Circle platform for my inner, for I use the free Facebook group because I've been at this for so long. So I have a pretty decent sized Facebook group. And it's like, how do you get rid of all those people? And they're there and they're engaged and we do challenges and all types of stuff. But then I have my community, my inner circle that's in the circle database. You ever heard of circle? Uh-uh. Oh, look that up. That's the new, new, uh, new thing for online communities. 
I heard of like Google circles a long time ago. Is Mm -mm. it still Google circles? And they're just trying to. No, this has nothing to do with Google. This is a company called circle and check it out. It runs online communities. You can run courses in there, programs, all type go live in there. The app is called circle. It's called circle. Okay. So like go to circle.com even. Uh, I think it's circle.app or actually I can tell you. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Either way, it was an expensive domain. (laughs) (laughs) All those single word domains are so damn expensive now. (laughs) Definitely. It's actually circle.so. And it's the all-in-one community platform for creators and brands. Nice. So you run like events, memberships, live stream, all types of stuff. It's amazing. It's not for posting so, content though. You can post content. In, oh, you mean like scheduling content? Uh, no, like, like if I'm like, oh, I'll post my reels over there. No, Mm-mm. no. It's okay. a private, this is where if you want to have a community, like let's say your podcast and you want to create a community for your podcast listeners, it's a community platform. Okay. I like it. I mean, podcasts need it more than any other kind of platform just because there's no Absolutely. comment section. So uh, awesome. Absolutely. Well, so much great value from you today. <laughs> Guys, make sure you follow Niala and go check out uh, her community here on, on Circle. Uh, so that's a new thing. Look for a, an <laughs> episode about what Circle is coming up soon too <laughs> when I figure it out. Um, and then if you want to continue this conversation, our podcast came out today as well. So check that out in the description. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much.